Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome. Uh, to get us started, a uh, reminder that the uh, quiz four is out. It's due 9 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, and this one is, in, there's a link to it on Moodle and from the course calendar, but it's not actually on Moodle this time. It's on a website called Gradescope. Uh, so if you don't have a Gradescope account, you should sign up with your Carlton email, and then you'll see a CS201 course that you should already be part of on Gradescope. Uh, the quiz this week, you are uh, uh, filling in some kind of out of a recursive method of a binary search of merge sort practicing uh, these algorithms that, that we've seen. After midterm break, our quizzes will start uh, being focused on writing Java code, and that is why we're moving to Gradescope. Moodle does not know how to tell whether your Java code is correct or not. Gradescope, you'll actually write code and submit it, and it will run tests automatically. So quizzes will, will move to code writing after the break, which is why we're switching over to Gradescope now. Uh, any uh, trouble or, or questions with the, the Gradescope quiz? Thank you. Great, let me know if there are any issues. Uh, there's also a prefect session. Yeah, um, so at 8 p.m. tonight, it's going to be a prefect session in this room. Uh, and so if you have any little recursion, let it be on the lab, on the quiz. You can, I mean, you can come here and ask for help. I'll probably struggle as well, but maybe less so. But that's okay. You can have a virgin side for all of us. Um, but yeah, please feel free to come down. And yeah, we just work on everything together. And yeah. Awesome. Uh, all right. Questions on the uh, Boggle Word Lab, any of the recursion or searching or sorting stuff we've been looking at? Ben? Oh. Would you like tell it to stop? Like, what's the stop all the possible words? Is that just like, if the prefix contains the word so far, then, it, then you keep going, call recursion, and then when you found the word, add it. And how do you tell it to stop? That's why I was confused. Yeah. So, good question. Whenever writing something recursive, is what should the base case be? When do we not want to make more recursive calls? Uh, and since in the case of the Boggle word finder. A recursive call is consider adding another letter to our word so far to see if we can make more words. And as Ben says, if our uh, set of prefix prefixes does not contain our word so far, as in our, the letters we've built up are not the start of any word in our dictionary, there's no more words that we could we can find starting with those letters. So how do we stop? Uh, we just return. The return is our way to say stop the current function, go back to wherever it was called. And the way that our recursive backtracking works is that when we return, that's like saying, okay, go back and undo the choice that led to here and try something different. So return will send us back to whatever the previous recursive call was. There's one other possible situation where you couldn't continue finding new words. And that is, is, is if, in the unlikely event, all 16 letters are part of a word that you found, there's no more letters. To, to incorporate into the word, and that's what the all visited method of uh, the board class can be used for. That's to check, uh, have I marked all 16 squares as visited? Because in that unlikely case, you should also not make recursive calls, because using any letter after you've already used all 16 would be using one twice, and that's not allowed. Did that answer your question, Ben? Other questions? Elena? I'm a little confused about how to do the nested words to go through all of the possible like, directions. Yeah, we're in a 
a situation where we're at a particular letter. And we have potentially eight possible letters that we'd want to try as, uh, in terms of uh, the next letter we could add to our word. And we're at this location here, which we'll say it's at some row and some column. And if we think about what is the position then of k here? Liam? Uh, row minus one, column minus one. Row minus one, column minus one. How about t? Jeffrey? Row plus one, column plus one. Row plus one, column plus one. Does this make sense why kind of, if row column is the one in the center and we go kind of one row left, uh, one column left, that's our column minus one, one row up, that's our row minus one. So this suggests that we want to go through all the rows from row minus one up to row plus one and all the columns from column minus one to column plus one. So if I were to write a for loop for the rows, I might say for r starting at row minus 1, r less than or equal to row plus 1, r plus plus. And so my variable r, which will be kind of the, the row coordinate of the next spot I'm going to take a letter from, the spot that I'll uh, do a recursive call for. We'll go from row minus one to row plus one to row to row plus one. And I can have a very similar loop inside this to go over the columns. I, I'll just have to, like the, I think one of the trickiest things about this Boggle algorithm is making sure that you are marking things as visited and then unvisited appropriately. For example, we don't want to use A a second time, but the way we would prevent that would we have previously marked A is visited, and we don't consider any new kind of any spot in here that has been marked visited. That's a way of preventing us from repeating ourselves. And if uh, the tests aren't passing. Uh, one important thing to check is that we want our, uh, the places we mark visited, we want that to be, we want to, it to be the case by the time a particular recursive call returns. Uh, we probably need it to have kind of undone all the stuff it marked as visited so that we've sort of reset our search to wherever it was before we made this recursive call. So you just kind of uh, think of it as you want the making things visited and making things unvisited to be balanced. Like if you make something visited somewhere in the function, it should later be made unvisited before the function returns. And there's uh, a nice example in our... Uh, Queen's problem where inside our loop you can think of place and remove here when we're putting a queen or removing a queen as visiting and unvisiting. 
And so there's a nice pattern where you visit the place right before you make a recursive call for it, and then you unvisit it once that returns. There's the extra wrinkle and boggle that we're also kind of adding a letter on to the word so far. Uh, but uh, this code for eight queens, and we'll do an exercise today uh, writing a function to solve Sudoku uh, that I think will be a kind of good reference as you implement the uh, find all words. Other questions on the lab? All right, let's get to practice. So first up, we talked about binary search and compared it to linear search. What makes binary search more efficient when we have sorted data? Amazing, 100%. Yay. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, we get to rule out half when we do binary search. It gives us our, our log n uh, spots we have to check. All right, here's one that's maybe a little tougher. So let's say we have a list of numbers. It's not sorted. And we have the choice between we could sort it, so using merge sort, our n log n uh, sorting algorithm, that would let us do our binary search, log n uh, search uh, efficiency, or we could leave it unsorted and just do linear search, which we know is, is big O of n. And so I want to know how, if we're considering a situation where we might do many searches, not just search this once, but many searches, how many searches would we need to do in order for it to be worth it to run merge sort so that we can do binary search versus just sticking with linear search. Because if binary search is more efficient than linear search, there should be a point at which it pays off to have done the work ahead of time of sorting the list. And this big omega here, our big O has been our upper bound, our worst case. Big omega is the lower bound. So it's like saying, what is the minimum number of times we would need to search in terms of n, the size of the list, such that it would be worth it to sort and be able to do binary search? All right, some votes for all four. Uh, discuss with your, your neighbors how you're thinking about uh, approaching when this trade-off would be worth it. Yeah, think about the situation where we're doing some number k of searches, and so we're comparing one merge sort plus k binary searches versus k linear searches. So we're asking what is the lower bound, what is the, which of these is the minimum k needs to be to make this. All right. I think it will be a lower bound of n in this case. The reason that, I guess, there are a few folks that uh, thought it might be n, any of you Care to share how you thought about this, Peter? Well, mathematically, if you have that equation, um, if you just plug in um, log of n, say, you get n log n plus log n squared equals n log n, and you have an extra term in the merge sort um, of log n squared, so that has to be bigger. Um, whereas if you plug in the next biggest term, um, n, you get that n log n plus um, n log n equals n squared, and then you get 2n log n equals n equals plus. Um, in that case, it's less than n squared, and therefore the lower bound. Yeah, we can, we can try plugging these different options in here. And if we plug in n in these cases, our 
n linear searches would be n squared, and our n binary searches, n log n, plus an n log n of the merge sort, and we know that n log n is more efficient than n squared. And if we, as Peter explained, if we plug in log n instead of, instead, our linear searches are n uh, log n times n, which is not worse than our, our merge sort. Seeing some, some con confused expressions, uh, what part of this uh, can, I, can I explain more? What questions do you have? Jeffrey? In this case, in the formula, um, would you care about constants multiplying or would you just take that out as well? Uh, the question is, do we care about constant factors? Uh, in this, um, uh, in this case, uh, by more efficient, I'm talking about in big O terms, so we wouldn't, but uh, in other cases, you might need to care about those when making this kind of choice. But in this case, we don't. No, do. This is a little easier when you have the answers and you can just plug them in, but if it was open-ended, how would you approach this problem? Uh, yeah, so I think the, the, the key idea that, I'm, that I, I'm hoping you take away from this is that when analyzing efficiency, it can matter how many times you need to do some particular operation. So if we said we're going to search once, then in this case, linear search, clearly better. O of n versus we have to sort the whole thing before we can search it all. Uh, so, like that's the, the the key takeaway that this might change if we need to search many times. So, all of the answers except uh, C would satisfy uh, like a number of searches that would make this superior. And then sort of the extra wrinkle was I was asking you the lower bound. What's the smallest number of searches among these choices that we could, we could make? Um, and so uh, uh, a good approach is to consider the efficiency of the thing that is being repeated and set up some expression involving that where you're multiplying the efficiency of the operation that's being repeated times the number of times that it's happening. Um, and like this would like it, it this would um, like if this was not multiple choice uh, I think the answer would not be n because there would be uh, n is not literally the smallest term that you could include here that would make this difference but it's uh, uh, of these options, it, it definitely is. Other questions on this? All right. One more of these, another definition one. What does a recursive backtracking algorithm do. I will agree with the majority here that our recursive backtracking uh, is our trying a choice, recursively exploring it, uh, and undoing the choice afterwards. Uh, does that make sense? Any, any questions on this? All right, so uh, we're now going to do uh, the activity I mentioned of writing uh, a function to uh, solve Sudoku puzzles. 
So if you're not familiar, uh, Sudoku is a, a popular puzzle game. Uh, looks something like this. We have a nine by nine board. Each of our cells gets a digit between one and nine. And a solution is that every column has all nine digits, one through nine with no repeats. Same for each row and same for each of these three by three squares. And in a uh, typical Sudoku puzzle, you're given some starting squares filled in and you need to figure out, okay, what numbers go in the rest of the squares to fill out the puzzle and follow all of these rules. Why are we returning true numbers? Yeah, it's a great, a great yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, we've uh, uh, got to uh, move on to our last, uh, last topic for today. But before we do, uh, what questions do you have about uh, this approach to our Sudoku solver? Shaka, did you have a, a question about? Yeah, I wasn't sure why it was returning to after the explore G. Yeah, so this is uh, a kind of subtle uh, aspect to this uh, this function, a, a twist I put on uh, the, the backtracking where we want to print out a solution if we find it. But we also want to have this explore function return true or false based on whether it was able to find a solution. And so we have a recursive call that hits our base case and returns true. But remember that our recursion is like a stack of function calls. So when the base case returns true, that's the recursive call at the top of the stack. So that gets popped off and returns to the next one. But then if we want to get that return, that true to get returned all the way to the original call, we have each of these calls in the stack has to keep returning true in order to keep it, keep it going. That if we didn't have this return true here, didn't have this if statement, our base case would return true, it would come back to here, and then this would keep going and wouldn't return anything to the function that called it. So we were like, maybe, uh, uh, maybe like 60 recursive calls deep and a return takes us back one recursive call and then that one needs to return and then the one before that needs to return so that we get this true returned all the way back up uh, to the original call. Does, does that make sense? What other questions do you have? All right. So before I go any further, I need to tell you about James A. Garfield, 20th president of the United States, uh, actual uh, uh, an alumnus of my alma mater, Williams College. So. Uh, I am slightly more familiar, I'm more familiar maybe with James Garfield than uh, just about uh, anyone would normally be. Uh, and uh, when he was elected as a, as a Republican, he was a bit of a, a reformer. Um, federal jobs in these days uh, were distributed using what was called the spoils system, which meant that, okay, Republicans won the election, uh, all the different federal offices are going to be held by people that helped Republicans get elected or their friends or their donors. And so uh, when uh, 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 Garfield got elected, lots of people were sort of expecting him to, to give them jobs uh, because they were kind of politically connected. Uh, and Grant and Hayes and now Garfield uh, had been working on what was called civil service reform. Maybe we should get, you know, people with actual qualifications into these jobs rather than kind of political cronies. Uh, and one of these cronies was a man named Charles J. Guiteau, who had played a minor role in the election, but he was convinced 
He was the reason that Garfield had been elected. Uh, and he bombarded them with requests to be ambassador to Paris or ambassador to Vienna. Uh, and they ignored him because why, would, why, why wouldn't they? Uh, and he decided that the only solution uh, was to assassinate James Garfield. And he showed up at a railroad station, I think, in Baltimore and shot the president. And there's some debate about whether Garfield died due to the bullet wound or due to the fact that doctors were operating on, on him without washing their hands, which was just, that wasn't really mainstream medical practice. Um, so he died of an infection, uh, some debate about why, uh, but this, uh, uh, so he served only about, about six months uh, in office before uh, Guiteau uh, shot him and, and his vice president, uh, Chester Arthur, took over, who we will hear about on Friday. Okay, so related to uh, this, this talk of, of uh, democracy, I would like to announce here my campaign for the governor of Minnesota in uh, 2022, election coming up in, in November. Uh, and I'm going to campaign on a platform of efficient data structures for all, uh, sure, to, sure to, to cap capture the hearts and minds uh, of the people. Uh, so. As part of this campaign, I'm going to need uh, a volunteer database. <laughs> uh, and I want some sort of database that maybe I can Given the name of some volunteer, I can find, look up information about them. Um, uh, their phone number, email, where they live, uh, as part of the, this, this organi organizing effort to, to get me to be governor. Uh, and if I wanted to implement this sort of like database of volunteers, uh, I'd be faced with the data structures that we've looked at so far don't give me operations of the form like given a name, find the related information. We have the ability given the index of some data structure, get me the information that's stored at that index, uh, but not these sort of two pieces of information, say a name and related data. None of our data structures have a way to associate these two things together. So this is a kind of new out of ink. A new abstract data type called a map, which is going to do exactly uh, this of letting me put into the map some key, some label, and associate some value with it. So this is my, my key would be the name of the volunteer, and the information about them would be the value that I'm associating with that key inside this map. It's kind of like the equivalent of like a Python dictionary. Yes, exactly. If you're familiar with a Python dictionary, it is an implementation of the map abstract data type. Um, and the other information we'll focus on is given a key, we want to return the associated value and our put is how we're going to add our key value pair, our key and its associated value. It's how we're going to add it to the map. So 
So going to walk through a bit of a bit of code related to this. All right. So first I have, uh, I'll actually start with this. I have a volunteer class. Just a, an object that's going to keep track of information about a volunteer. And see the name, phone, email, where they live. Uh, and it has get and set methods for each of these, each of these private fields. Then I have a program with a main method, process volunteers, which uses something that we're going to define called a list map, which, as the name suggests, is going to be a implementation of our map using a list. And this map will have strings as the keys. It's going to have the names of the volunteers. And then the data are going to be these volunteer objects. So we're going to say volunteer name, given it, we're going to say take this volunteer name and associate it with this volunteer object, or given the volunteer name, return to me the associated volunteer object. And there is a CSV file with a bunch of uh, data about volunteers, like Abe Lincoln, Ilhan Omar, Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Stevie P. Uh, all part of my glorious campaign. And each one, I'm going to create a new volunteer and put it into the map. So if I have my list map imp implementation, uh, before we've had something like E here, some sort of placeholder for the type of thing that's going to go in our data structure, here we have two kinds of things in our data structure. We have the, the type that our keys have and the type that our values have. So we actually have two different placeholders that I have called K and V. And so if I want to keep track of the things in my map, I would like to use a linked list, but I have a problem, which is the linked list stores one kind of thing, but I have these sort of pairs of things, a key and a value that go together. Now, if this was Python, does anyone have a suggestion for if I want to kind of put two things together, something that could do that in Python. Or something, right? Exactly. In Python, we have tuples that we can take multiple values and kind of group them together into uh, a sequence called a tuple. Java, we don't have that. So in Java, if I want to group two things together, I've got to write it myself. So I've written this little association class because I'm associating a key with a value. Simple little class, a private key and value that I can initialize with a constructor and then I can retrieve what the key and value are. And that's it. So it's just a class to take two separate values and kind of put them together into one thing. And so that lets me say that I'm going to have a list of associations from keys to values inside my map. So I'm going to provide these sort of put and get methods, but underneath, just going to have this linked list of these key value pairs, these associations. So start off with a constructor and just say my items is going to be a new linked list. Just started out with an, with an empty linked list uh, of these associations and uh, 
I will put in a new key and value and I might initially say, okay, all I need to do is create a new association of this key and value and add it to my linked list. But there's a, another part of this map ADT that I didn't tell you about, which are keys are unique. That if, say, I have a volunteer name, it should only appear once in my map so that I can, given the name, look up a particular info about that volunteer. And so I'm going to need some way of making sure that when I add a new key value pair to my map, that if there is already that key, this will replace the value it's associated with it. So our put is going to add a new key value pair to that or replace an existing one if something already exists for that key. So yeah, let's if it was private instead of public, would it still change it? Uh, if what was private? Like if the fields to like put it in there was private, would it still change it? Uh, so you can think of it as uh, if I have an entry for uh, 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 volunteer uh, Cleopatra, uh, and I have another put like Cleopatra volunteer object. You should have the effect of change of changing which volunteer object is associated with Cleopatra. It's so that if I want to update her information, she, uh, she's moved, her phone number has changed, I put in an, uh, a new entry into the map that replaces the old one. And that's just what we want put, how, that's how we want put to behave. Because we're specifically looking for this structure where every key appears at most once. All right, so on that thrilling cliffhanger, I will leave you until Friday. Uh, I have office hours in the lab tomorrow night, 7.30. Uh, the check-in post for lab four due tonight, 9 p.m. Quiz tomorrow, 9 p.m. And I'll see you on Friday.